thank you. So for the anecdote, I work uh, in Ericsson at a team uh, called Gaia, but it stands for the Global AI Accelerator. And when I was about to, to join the company, I, I did some research about this team, and I found out that they had this uh, conference where they invite people from all over the field. And they do this every spring in Gothenburg. And uh, of course, uh, it was not uh, an Ericsson conference that I had found, but this one. So that's um, how, how I'm here, by this lucky uh, mistake. And, uh <laughs> and uh, at Ericsson, we do a lot of um, interesting things, even though we don't organize this conference. But um, I will not talk about that today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the area in which I'm doing uh, my PhD. And I want to start by talking about baboons and geometry. So if we present a few pictures like these to a baboon and we ask it to point out the outlier, it will not be able to point at this picture. Yet we as humans recognize that there's something different with this picture because it has a different shape, a different geometric regularity. So how do we even ask a baboon something? Um, researchers can test the intelligence of baboons by letting them answer questions on a touch screen like this. And baboons are pretty smart. They can ace pretty advanced cognitive tests, and they can recognize basic shapes like these ones, but they do seem to have a blind spot when it comes to recognizing geometric regularity, such as distinguishing the rectangle from the less uh, regular polygons in this picture. And whereas we as, as humans may have what may be called um, a, a native sense of geometry. And these researchers, they went to quite some length to try to prove that this is a uh, human universal feature, so they gave this kind of geometry test to children in kindergarten, and they even went out to uh, Namibia to give this kind of test to members of an indigenous people over there, to try to make the point that uh, geometry is a universal human feature, but that we don't share with other animals. So if you're willing to believe that, and maybe our um, long-term goal is to build human-level AIs, then maybe geometry is um, something to look at. So what about machine learning? What if instead of training baboons, we train neural networks? So what these researchers did was to um, take a pre-trained convolutional neural network and take these kind of pure geometric shapes, pass them through the network, and see where they ended up in the internal representation space, in the embedding space. For example, checking if uh, similar shapes end up in the same area of the internal representation space. And this was not the case and may indicate that the neural network doesn't use shape in order to organize its information internally. Maybe it doesn't have any concept of shape. And that seems to be uh, corroborated by uh, quite a lot of research. Here uh, we have a cat, and if we give it the skin of an elephant, we get the picture uh, to the right. And um, I don't know about you, but I would still think of this as a cat that tries to disguise as an elephant somehow. But the neural network is happily convinced that this is now an elephant. And this may indicate a strong uh, bias towards uh, using texture and a strong bias against using shape in making its uh, decisions. So in many cases, th this kind of bias is fine, but I'll try to convince you that sometimes we want neural networks to also consider um, the shape. And if we want that, maybe we can teach them with a little bit of math. So in math, um, shapes are studied in the field of um, geometry that we may be familiar with from elementary school. And in geometry, we look at properties like distances, angles, curvature, properties that are very uh, sensitive to changes in the underlying object. For example, in this picture, if we start with the ball in the top left and we successfully deform it in small steps, then actually um, all these steps will represent a change in the geometry of the object. But shapes also studied in the field of topology, and in topology we look instead at properties that don't change even if we stretch or twist or bend the space. So we get properties that are very insensitive, very global, but thus also very robust. Uh, for example, in this picture, it's only in these steps that we have a change in the topology of the object, only if we tear it apart or puncture it. And mathematicians have uh, thought about uh, geometry for thousands of years and about topology for at least a couple of hundred years. Um, but even, even before there were any computers around, but more recently there has been a focus to try to develop algorithms to actually compute these kind of properties. And in the field of topological data analysis, TDA, which we'll talk about today, we look more specifically at the shape of data, at the shape of um, spaces that arise in data analysis. So in other words, at the shape of data. And um, 
at some basic level, what we do is trying to tap into this sort of ancient knowledge in math and try to see what happens if we adapt it to data, to machine learning. And maybe that's something that could be interesting uh, more generally. If I were to generalize uh, just a little bit, I would say that perhaps the algorithms that we use and love today are all based on relatively few mathematical pillars in the end. And uh, maybe there's a, a message to that, to that simplicity, but maybe by adding a little bit of math from new fields that could be beneficial to the field. And that's the uh, direction that the uh, WASP research program is, uh, is exploring, since it finances a lot of uh, uh, research at the intersection of, of math and machine learning. And at KTH specifically, we have an active uh, research group in this field of, uh, of TDA. But what do we mean when we talk about the shape of data? So in the introduction, we talked about uh, rectangles and polygons. But of course, in reality, we would like to say something about the shape of real data. What is the shape of this point cloud here? Um, or of this second point cloud? How do they compare? Maybe to the left, I have a training set. And to the right, I have a set of simulated samples from that training set. And I would like to see how similar they are. Maybe intuitively, these spaces look more similar because there's a similar clustering structure going on. But how do I know which properties to look for? And how can I compare spaces that may have different coordinate systems, that may have different number of points, or even different dimensions, as in this example? So let's take uh, an example of a method used in TDA. We'll start with a point cloud, and we'll take it to be in two dimensions for the sake of the illustration. Next, we will select a threshold. And then we will connect all the points that are at distance smaller than that threshold. Doing so, we get a graph. And from that graph, we can compute the number of connected components. So let's take an example. If we start with a low threshold, then no points are connected yet, because no points are at a distance smaller than this threshold. But if we increase it, we now have some points that start being connected. And if we look at the graph, we, have, we see that we now have five connected components. And if we increase the threshold, we have more points being connected and fewer components. And in the end, for a large enough threshold, we just have one large component because all the points will be uh, connected. And the information about the connectedness of the space at all thresholds can be summarized in the, in the dendrogram. So if we look at the lowest threshold that corresponds to the dashed vertical line, and we see that it intersects uh, nine horizontal lines for the nine components that were alive at that time. At the next threshold, it intersects five horizontal lines. So in the dendrogram, we can see how many components were alive at each threshold, but also how smaller ones merge into larger ones if we follow the tree structure. And the connectedness, the number of connected components, is a topological property. If we remember from the introduction, that was one of the cases where the ball was split in two pieces. And this is a fairly common recipe for methods in TDA that we uh, take a space such as a point cloud, and we look at it at different thresholds. And for each threshold, we compute a graph or sometimes another kind of combinatorial object, but something from which we can easily read out a topological property. So we get this multi-scale, multi-threshold view of our space, where we see how a topological property changes as we vary this threshold. And if the dendrogram uh, maybe looks familiar, it's maybe because it's also used in uh, hierarchical clustering. Um, there it's often used to select a threshold, and once we have a threshold, we can go back to the space and look at the connected components. Only we don't call them that, we call them clusters. So for each threshold, we get the clustering of the space. But in TDA, we would rather want to say something about uh, the shape of the whole space. So maybe let's keep the whole uh, dendrogram. And if we get the second space, we can get the dendrogram for that and compare the shape, the connectedness of the spaces through the dendrograms. We just have to take one additional step uh, and convert this object into something called uh, a barcode that will track how topological properties appear and for how long they persist. For example, we had one component here that appeared at threshold zero, persisted for a little while until it was merged into a larger component. So we get a bar for that. And if we do the same for the whole dendrogram, we get the whole set of bars, the barcode. And this is something we can have uh, a distance on, an optimal matching type distance. So that now, if we get the second space, we can get this dendrogram and its barcode, and we can compare the connectedness, one aspect of the shape of these spaces in this way. And that's one of the main objectives of this method, to sort of characterize the shape and compare it uh, between different spaces. Thank <laughs> you.
And the methods in, uh, in TDA can be uh, parameterized, so we can capture different uh, aspects of geometry. And if we include them in a neural network, then these parameters can be learned based on data. Sometimes we don't want to capture um, some uh, shape information about the data set, but we would rather want to control the shape of some data set or maybe some embedding space. And that can be done too. And finally, while we took the example of a point cloud, um, these methods apply to more general types of, of inputs, such as graphs and images. But now for the remainder of the um, talk, let's look at some examples where these uh, methods can be used. So our brains are full of uh, neuronal and glia three cells, um, such as the ones we can see in this picture. And neuroscientists uh, need ways to compare the shape of these cells and relate their shape to the role they play in the nervous system. For example, in uh, a project to which I collaborated with uh, my colleagues at, at KTH and a group of neuroscientists, we looked at the shape of microglia cells in the brains of mice, and we looked at whether that shape is different for different brain regions or maybe different for uh, healthy versus diseased mice and so on. But to do all these things, we first have to take these physical, biological things and convert them to data. Now we could open the brains of some mice and make some measurements. Uh, maybe I count the number of branches or I measure how long they are. I could also put these together uh, in a feature vector. Or maybe I take uh, a picture of the cell, maybe in 3D, so I get a, a voxel representation of it. Now the first approach might not be rich enough. Maybe those measurements that I choose might not be the ones that reflect the variability between cells in the best way. But the second approach might be too rich, too high dimensional, and it does not incorporate the prior knowledge that neuroscientists have about these objects. For example, the fact that they are uh, invariant under translations or rotations, and the fact that the thickness, for example, that we see in this picture is mostly the result of the staining process done in the laboratory. Now, in theory, a neural network could learn this aspect if it has enough labeled data and the right structure. But those are pretty big ifs, and uh, uh, one of the themes um, of, of TDA is that we can try to incorporate some of these um, priors into the data or into the um, structure of the neural network to perhaps make the training more efficient um, or the network more robust. But at an even more uh, fundamental level, um, whether we represent the data as a small feature vector or a large vector representing it as a picture, we somehow still make the same underlying assumption that the data can be represented as a vector at all, that the data is Euclidean. And um, that is not the only choice. Um, in this project, we choose to model the data topologically. So we look at how the branching structure changes as we move from the extremity towards the root of these trees. So in the introduction, we looked at connectedness for a point cloud when we merged points together. Um, and here it's uh, similar. We also looked at, look at connectedness, but we have a tree and the threshold is sort of how we reveal this tree, starting from the extremity, moving towards the root. But we get these kind of descriptors, the barcode, um, and that is our data. But it is not uh, Euclidean data. And that's something that I found interesting moving, moving into this kind of project, that um, we don't have to restrict ourselves to, um, to a vector or some predefined uh, list of data, but uh, we can, with some math, sometimes invent new data. And I would say that data is anything on which we can have a language with which we can reason in some precise way. So if you give me a type of object and you can measure distances between those objects, maybe you can add two of these objects together, maybe even have some law of large numbers to develop some statistics. If you have these things or some of these things, I would say that what you have um, is data. So sometimes we can come up with new types of data and what, when what we want to capture is sort of the shape, the morphology of some underlying object, then we can do it with these methods. So in that sense, uh, this can be seen as part of the movement of geometric deep learning that encourages us to look beyond Euclidean uh, geometries and learn on graphs or sets or, or other things. Once we have data, we can do um, data analysis. Here, uh, just to take an example, we have done uh, a dimensionality reduction of the cells with respect to their shape. And now we can, for example, compare and see whether that uh, layout uh, of these cells modeled this way with respect to the shape somehow corresponds to the uh, physical layout of these cells uh, in the different brain regions. Uh, that's the picture to the, to the right there. <coughs> 
let's uh, stay in the brain. Uh, here we have a picture of a neural circuit, so a small region of the brain. And let's now task ourselves with uh, delimitating the individual neurons in this picture. So in other words, we have uh, an image segmentation task. And in a standard image segmentation task, we may have a bunch of uh, pictures coupled with their segmentation masks. So a human annotator, uh, maybe a PhD student in neuroscience in this case, has taken these images and has colored the regions corresponding to the different neurons with different colors. And then we can feed um, the picture to a neural network that can have various architectures, but maybe will be composed of some convolutional layers followed by some deconvolutional layers. Uh, as in this example, so that we get at the end the prediction for each pixel telling which segment the network thinks the pixel uh, belongs to. <coughs> and that is something we can um, compare to the ground truth and construct a loss function. But let's uh, pause for a, for a second and think about what this loss function uh, encourages the network to learn. So it's a purely local loss function. We go pixel by pixel, we check whether it was um, correctly classified to the right segment and then we take a sum and average. So there is no way uh, that this um, loss function really can account for a more global properties, such as accounting for the, the shape of these uh, segmentation masks. So the neural network might very well um, output something like this, that it thinks looks good because it has um, a low loss and uh, uh, maybe most pixels were correctly classified, but it may not be satisfactory to our human eyes because it has this fragmented shape. So what we would really like is a way to tell the neural network to consider not just the pixel by pixel loss, but also something more global, taking into account the, the shape, maybe indicating that we want a few consistent uh, segments, like in the ground truth, and not this fragmented way. And that is something we can encode with the language of TDA. So if we produce one of these um, descriptors, the barcodes for the ground truth, and another one for the output of the neural network, then we can compare these and include that comparison into the loss function so that the neural network will be uh, penalized for producing um, outputs that deviate topologically with respect to the shape from the ground truth. And perhaps arriving at pictures that look a little bit more like this. So we've looked at uh, a first example uh, of how we can sort of model data um, with respect to the shape, that was the, the neuronal trees. And then we looked at um, how we can reason about maybe the shape of these segments in, in an image. Now, as a last example, let's talk about the shape of uh, embedding spaces. So I think embedding spaces are very uh, important in machine learning. We, we heard about them uh, in many talks today. Um, and I guess, um, in some sense, uh, most, maybe all, machine learning problems could be seen as sort of constructing a the right geometry for an embedding space. If we have a classification problem, what we really want is to have uh, an embedding space where the, em the embeddings form uh, clusters according to the different classes. Or if we have a word embedding, we want the distance between the embeddings to correspond to the, um, to the, the meaning, the, the similarity between the, the words in the language, and so on. And maybe that's an area where um, TDA can uh, provide some, some perspective. Here we have a uh, autoencoder, and if we look at the bottleneck space, then, we, then that's an embedding space that will contain uh, an embedding of the um, input in the lower dimension, and um, it, that will, in some sense, um, contain as much data as possible about the uh, about the data set. And uh, a classical autoencoder is uh, uh, maybe trained with a reconstruction loss, so we. Um, take our sample, we pass it through the network, and we see what we get at the other end, and we compare the reconstruction to the input, and uh, then we just do this for all samples, and we take a sum and an average. So it's a little bit similar to the previous example in that we would, uh, in the basic case, only consider um, these each sample individually. We, we don't have any way in this loss function to control for the shape of the embedding space. So if we imagine that we have um, a data set that would be in three dimension and just happens to have the shape of a mammut, don't ask me why, and we want to uh, reduce its dimension to two, then we could get something like this, or maybe something like that. And 
these pictures in the middle and to the right are both legitimate solutions, um, optimal solutions to some optimization problems, but the problems have been formulated differently. And in the uh, picture to the right, we have um, the researchers have added one of these uh, topological laws that also tries to align the shape of the embedding space to the shape of the original data set. And um, this matters or not, uh, depending on the on the application. But uh, what I want to um, try to um, to say is that the neural networks will never be smarter than the loss functions we we assign to them. But if we want them to have some concept of shape, we can tamper with this loss function, and for example, by including methods from TDA, or model things directly at the level of the data that we feed into them, to encourage it to. Um, to take the shape into consideration. So I tried to give just some, some diverse examples uh, that I'm not very um, knowledgeable about, and only one of these I, uh, I collaborated to, just to give you um, an idea of what, um, what is done in this uh, field to start a discussion and see if you see some, some applications for these methods, whether you have some mammoth you want to flatten or maybe something else. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Let's see. Yeah, one over there. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, for the barcodes, how do you define uh, distance? So it's um, it's an optimal transport type distance, so you, you find a minimum cost of matching these bars, and you can also allow to have different numbers of bars, then you can sort of match it to a zero. That's, that's the idea. Any other question? So while you're thinking about the uh, question, I will squeeze in one of mine. Uh, do you have a Python package for calculating this typo loss, topo loss? Yes, there's a growing um, ecosystem of, um, of um, yeah, let's say um, Python packages or plugins to to PyTorch and, and TensorFlow, so that these things can be um, can be um, yeah, one can try them out relatively easily. Okay. Uh, do you have a name? Uh, maybe if someone. Uh, there's yeah, there's like Torch Topological is one, um, and. Um, yeah, the, the main package to sort of uh, compute these barcodes is called uh, Ripser from, from Point Cloud Data. Um. How much computation time does it add to training by calculating these barcodes and adding that transport loss? It can add uh, quite a lot because these are, um, the distances themselves take, uh, can be relatively computationally heavy and uh, we also want to use because we want to capture these global aspects, we we want to to use maybe a, um, maybe not all data set, but at least a whole batch to compute these. Uh, so it can it can add a little bit, and that's something that um, there is some work um, being done on on, on currently, and um, yeah, try to to optimize those things. Okay, we have a question there. Yes. Uh, so my question concerns the lengths of the uh, or the distance measurements, uh, and I'm wondering. It it feels like it must make a big difference if you know the number of dimensions uh, that your problem handles. If it's a two-dimensional representation of a 3D object, or if it's actually something that exists on a surface, because otherwise you could have two overlapping points, but they're separated in depth. And that would be a big distance, whereas on the projected screen or in the image, they would lie on top of each other. So I'm wondering, like, uh, how much are you affected by the dimensionality of of the problem? You mean in the dimensionality reduction? Uh, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, say say that you have an image, whether you're looking at it, uh, whether whether what you're looking at in the image is intrinsically two two D or if there's depth information also. Yeah. Yeah, that's in a sense one uh, 
one thing that these methods try to 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 figure out whether these data live on a lower dimensional manifold in some sense using the the distances but um, uh, there can still be problems with um, i think course of dimensionality if you start with a very big uh, space and that's a little bit difficult to um, to even think about i mean we have this example of something 3d that we take to 2d but uh, what is the shape of something in a very high dimensional space and how to think about it and is that the property we want to uh, preserve that's um, maybe even a, yeah, a philosophical <laughs> question in, in some sense. Or so, so could you <laughs> preserve the barcode here in the mammoth example? Sorry? Could you preserve the barcode in the mammoth example? Yes, fairly, yeah, in this case, fairly well, yeah. Okay. yeah I mean, I, it feels like you must have some information on whether there is something to be gained in depth before even uh, adding it to the loss function or like when you create your barcodes or these distance and summarize it in a distribution of distances, then you must know whether you're doing it in 2D or 3D or like... Uh, yeah, this, um, that, th that can add... Um, um, like uh, uh, otherwise you, you might have one distribution if you make an assumption that you have all, all of the lengths correct because it's a 2D problem. But if it's actually a 3D problem, then maybe your distribution would look very different because you have high, uh, high, um, large lengths in depth uh, that you just don't capture in, in the 2D screen or like in the 2D image. And so th your distribution would be skewed. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, would be interesting to try. I mean, in, in this example, it tries to capture this basic thing that the elephant is connected and in the, the example of the middle this was sort of split apart when when the, the maybe the dimensional introduction only considered uh, uh, minimizing the distances and um, and that is um, what I think is preserved in, in this example for example um, but yeah could be different properties and well, we could if we can talk about it over coffee <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's very interesting thank you thank you do we have another question from the audience yeah over here Okay, thank you. <coughs> so could you talk a little bit about how to incorporate in the loss function? Do you know how it scales compared to the the, the um, straight up loss function? For some example, do you have any? Uh, how do you mean how it scales? Because I, I, I mean, th the way you're describing it is you have this, I mean, you have a loss function as a normal loss function, and then you would include the topology as a part of the loss function as sort of an aspect of the loss, right? Yeah. Do you know um, how it scales compared to the to the other loss? On what level is it? Uh, you mean like the um, computational complexity, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I guess uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, not the computational complexity. Um, more of a sort of um, how important. <laughs> Do you, you get better scores on ImageNet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I. <laughs> I. Um, I don't know. I'm not uh, an expert in image segmentation. <laughs> I hope to talk to <laughs> to someone here uh, who is. Um, but it, it definitely needs both. So uh, I've never seen uh, something just using this uh, only the, the topological loss because that's really too too coarse. So it needs um, this um, local information, uh, pixel by pixel, sample by sample uh, in these examples, and then this can can add a little bit of sort of um, topological regularization of the space in, in some sense. That's uh, what I've seen. So Before we uh, go for coffee break, so did you solve that cat problem with the topological loss? <laughs> no, that is actually um, somewhat uh, unrelated, <laughs> <laughs> <It's> mostly <laughs> for, <laughs> for inspiration. <laughs> but they actually also uh, have this, uh, this idea that um, bias, uh, that, that shape matters, but they don't approach it using these kind of methods. Uh, I think they do. Um, maybe data augmentation or to use some other techniques to to see what happens if we force a neural network to actually consider the shape. Will um, will it see the the cat and not the the elephant? So that's um, okay. to be continued. <laughs> yes.